Heath, and I'm a program manager for Skills Commons, which is currently the largest workforce training repository in existence worldwide. Um, materials that are populated in uh, Skills Commons were developed out of the uh, TACT initiative, the nearly $2 billion effort under Department of Labor. It just closed up our final, the fourth round, final round. Many of um, a number of folks that are here today, I know, uh, uh, participated in that initiative as well. And um, we've had some pretty incredible work happen and collected in Skills Commons because of that. I'm joined today by Skills Commons Senior Program Manager, Rick Lumadu. Rick, do you want to say hello real quick? Hi, everybody. Hi. Glad to be here and looking forward to this presentation. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate that. And we also have storytelling consultant, Alexandra Shiner. Alexandra, you want to say hello real, real quick? Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you. So that's a little sound check for us. And we have distinguished guests, Sarah Stubblefield and Tom Wiley of Northwest State Community College out of Ohio. And our topic today is centered around a uh, competency-based hybrid model. Some pretty incredible things have been happening in Ohio. This is one of them. We're really excited to be able to share this. And I'm going to turn it over to Alexandra, our storytelling expert. And Alexandra, it's off to you. Thanks, Maria. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad you're here today. As Maria mentioned, I'm Alexandra Shiner. I am one of the Impact Community Ambassadors for the Storytelling Network. And in my role, I work with different individuals across community colleges. It just so happens to be that I've been working with Northwest State for about the last year. I'll introduce you to our guests in a few moments. But for now, I want to get started. I want to thank you all for coming to Attack Tale. Um, this is our way of incorporating storytelling into the great work that Northwest State has been doing. Uh, this is the result of the TACT Round 4 grant that they just wrapped up. And I'm going to just share briefly with you a little bit about why we think storytelling is so important, what it's designed to do, and then I'll hand things over to Sarah and Tom out in Ohio. Okay, so what you see on the screen is a little overview about storytelling. Here at Skills Commons, we believe that storytelling is a great strategy to utilize for scaling efforts as well as sustaining impact. I'm gonna just read to you what you see on the screen to kind of kick things off. So stories are a way to help problem solve, provide guidance, build confidence, or share the wisdom of those who have walked these steps previously. Stories can be used to help others overcome challenges and invite them to embark upon the next steps in their own journeys. In a moment, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the journey that Northwest State has gone on to tell their own story, but I wanna also point out why we think that stories are worth spending so much time developing. Stories can be really strategic. They're a great way to help solve common problems. They can resonate with audiences. Most importantly, they celebrate successes along with challenges that someone has overcome along the way. Stories are a great opportunity to reflect on the experiences that one has had, they complement reporting, meaning that this is likely something that many of you are familiar with as it's usually a piece embedded within reporting. We think that they're a great way to reach a broader audience. So a little bit later into the webinar today, you're going to see in about a minute and a half a piece of one of the stories that the Northwest State Community College group um, helped to develop in a video. And we think it's quickly digestible in that you will be able to see the main ideas of this intensive hybrid model and the strategies that they've utilized. As an ambassador, one of the things that's always really impressive to me when I've engaged in this kind of work is that grantees, along with other individuals who are trying to understand what are they doing really well, how can we share this and get other people excited about it, is that it's an opportunity to pause and reflect on what's working and what isn't. When I first started working with Sarah Stubblefield, she told me the quote that you see on the screen, actually. Um, and this is kind of the challenge that Northwest State had when they began um, taking their tax funds and thinking about how could we utilize these in an impactful way. In Ohio, they, let, they had let us know that employers were telling them that they need X amount of employees. If they can't find them in Ohio, we might have to move operations elsewhere. Sarah believed that this was a common challenge that others in the state and across the country might also be facing. Furthermore, it was a conversation that they needed to have at the community college level about how they can get more students to complete quicker, 
what kinds of training are they getting enough hands-on assessment opportunities to really gain the skills that they'll need in the field and how can we develop some kind of pipeline between the college and employers and really what's at stake what's on the line so you'll see a little bit later into the webinar today how Northwest State has found a way to address that problem they've had tremendous success with the intensive hybrid model um, and I'm really proud to be a part of this project. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to today's presenters out in Ohio, my dear friend and colleague, Sarah Stubblefield, who is the training coordinator of industrial technologies and Tom Wiley, who is the associate vice president of special projects. Sarah and Tom, go for it. Thank you, Alexandra. It has been a pleasure working with you and everybody over at Skills Commons to help us to address the issues and communicate what we wanted to to our community and beyond. Um, what we wanna do is we wanna set up for you today an overview of what we're going to discuss. And we're gonna to explain to you how our two-year community college has moved to 17 industrial courses into a intensive competency-based hybrid model. And we're also gonna discuss the impact of the data from that model and the learning strategies, as well as lessons that we've learned from the journey. <laughs> hey, we need to pause for a second. Maria, uh, for some reason, our slides are not advancing, so we don't have the controls. There we go. Okay. Now we are. So here's the, what we're doing for today. As Alexandra discussed, why would we go to this change? Why would we even bother um, putting the time and effort into this initiative. Well, it came from a discussion with our employers who were saying, hey, if we can't get the workers that we need in our area, we're going to leave. And we were also worried about the employers and a, and a potential loss of business to both private and public sectors. We weren't getting the job done. Somebody else is going to do it, right? At the same time, employers had become aware of open exit and open entry, entry models, and they were getting curious as to why we weren't moving to that ourselves. And so in 2013 and 14, we developed the REAN initiative and went out and got the voice of the customer. We gathered 50 individuals in, in groups of five, and we got quantitative data from them. The comments were brought back to the improvement team so that we can focus on what we needed to do next. Some of that data told us that our curriculum needed to be realigned, that we were talking more in class about what the textbox, textbooks wanted us to discuss, and they weren't aligned to their workforce skills. We were also getting inconsistent students once they graduated. If they hired four students, two could do the job and two could not do the job. And we needed to worry less on the theory of how things operated and get more hands-on skills in the classroom. We heard a lot that our traditional schedule wasn't working for them. And in, as a nation, it usually takes about six years to get an associate's degree. And at, here at Northwest State, we were on par with that. So that needed to change as soon as possible. So Northwest State, we went after and were awarded two federal grants. In 2014, we were awarded around four TAC grants. And then in 2015, we were awarded a National Science Foundation grant. And we used these two grants to, to leverage the human and physical resources we needed to make these changes. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, our old model versus the new model. <clears throat> As you can see from this graphic, in the top portion is where we were originally probably not atypical for many of the two-year colleges around the country. These were all technical courses, and it was based on the textbook. The student material was out of the textbook. Face-to-face -face instruction, the pacing of the student was based on the instructor, and a traditional grading, maybe a midterm and a final, or three written or online tests, and a 16-week semester. Uh, if you look at the bottom portion, after three years, this is where we are at aligned industry, uh, to, uh, we're aligned with the industry skill standards. Uh, our student material is active learning objects now. Our delivery method is hybrid, flexible pacing by the students, so competency-based is mastery of skills and, and flexible pacing. 
The hands-on experience is aligned with workplace skills, our assessment, uh, we're, we're testing the hands-on, and we moved to an eight-week model, and that was a big thing for us, uh, moving to that model. So um, we looked at our first three courses, and I analyzed the first three because it was on one of our NSF grants that I was a PI on, and it was programmable controllers, motors and controls, and robotics. All 200-level courses, all automation, all in high demand by our employers, and we saw that in the last two years, comparing it to the two previous years before we switched to the model, we saw an enrollment increase of 44% in those three courses. We saw a 7% increase in student GPA attainment, and we saw a 10% increase in course completions, which is really big in Ohio for us because we don't get state SSI if a student does not complete a course. So those were, that is the data from our first three courses. There are a lot of moving pieces with this project and in order to really explain it to anyone really, um, I jumped at the chance to work with the storytelling network so that I could come up with a very concise and easy way to explain what we're doing. And I wanna show a portion of the video that we developed together because I think it will help you as you're following along with this webinar understand all the pieces that we're discussing today. So I'm going to, to play just a small section and bear with me because I'm going to go. I have bookmarked the times that we needed. The community decided to pilot four strategies to accelerate completion and address employer needs. Curriculum was streamlined, standardized, and realigned to employer needs. Employer partners do more than sit on advisory boards. They are invited into the classroom to give students a first-person perspective. Classes were converted from 16 weeks to an eight-module intensive hybrid format. Every module has a knowledge assessment and a hands-on assessment. Technology was used to accelerate learning. Virtual trainers and simulations allow students to learn course objectives anytime, anywhere. Impact analysis shows that students are learning 10% more in half the time without realizing it. They are able to put together lab work off-site and come onto campus to demonstrate hands-on competencies. Students are able to process through the material at their own pace without being allowed to fall behind. This is due to both academic advising and career coaching. Students are taught skills to manage themselves in their careers while supportive staff help students to eliminate barriers to their education. Traditional schedules no longer work for students or employers. There is an open lab format that allows students to access instructors and equipment on demand. Software was developed to make scheduling easier for all parties. Students don't have to choose between work or school. And, and that was the key of it. Students don't have to choose between work and school and employers shouldn't have to decide whether they need to send someone for training or be able to fill an order that came into their facility. So here's some screenshots of, of the video. Um, it, it is out at Skills Commons and there'll be links as well in the ending slides of, of this webinar so that you can go out and look for it yourselves. But I want you to know that we're gonna focus today on a lot of the hybrid model, which we consider to be flexible pacing and mastery of skill. But we also developed other components such as that flexible lab, which we could discuss all day, and we had a lot of career coaching components. Um, the grant has ended, but we have continued with those items, and we now have an advising center that targets students in the same way. So we converted from 16 weeks to eight weeks, and as you can see here, it allows us to have two classes in the same time that we used to have one class. And so just with that change alone, students are able to complete in half the time that they were before, it's interesting to note that the college already had the capacity to do part of term courses. And so uh, that gave us a step ahead when we wanted to convert these classes. So I want to talk a little bit about the assessment and the impact of it. Uh, our assessment model has completely changed and that's probably had the greatest impact on our project. And I'm going to talk about those in depth, but the students are now individually assessed. Talk about a change. We, we use the term or the, the phrase, if you want to change a student's learning behavior, you change the assessment model. 
And so individual one-on-one -on -one assessment by the faculty, thus the students develop more hands-on skills. Sarah talked about that earlier. That was one of the requests from one of our employers or multiple employers, more hands-on skills. Now the students are developing better, more hands-on skills. One of the things really changed was the role of our faculty. And that is that they had moved from a standard uh, instruction and doing three tests to where they're now more of a learning facilitator. And they do primarily assessment when they meet with the students and some one-on-one -on -one interactivity with them, but it's really changed their role and there's a lot of buy-in with our faculty. We've also saw a larger employer engagement because they helped us build our assessment model. And that has really changed once again how we do about everything. So the two types of assessments that we use is knowledge and application assessments. We'll use KAAs for short, and these are taken through the LMS and the students have to get at least 80% on these assessments. The hands-on assessments, or we'll call those HOAs for short, that's our terminology around here. Um, we, this is the one-on-one -on -one between the faculty and the student. The students have to get 100% on this. This is full mastery. This is the, the competency-based portion. So our student grading model has gone to an A, B, or an F for a course versus just uh, versus uh, having C's and D's in there as well. This is a graphic that I have used in a number of presentations. It's a little busy, but it explains a little more in depth about the KAs and the HOAs and we'll be getting into those a little more as the presentation progresses. As we cut the time in half that a student was on campus, we had to replace some of that lecture time into our learning management system. And this gave students 24 seven access to all of the course materials. Our online courses were also standardized in terms of look and feel. They are all set up the exact same way. So our students don't have to learn to learn every time they take a new course with us. Faculty was very hands-on with the development of the LMS, and they were the ones to identify the best way to convey an idea or a topic to the student because they knew the material the best. They also support the online learning by having open hours or getting on and having forums and other discussions online with students that doesn't replace the hands-on, one-on-one time that they have with students as well. Our flexible lab model means that we have a scheduled time every week for the students to come in and work on their hands-on assessments. But if the students are identifying that they need more time with either the instructor, the instructor or the equipment, they can schedule that time. We have a mechanism for that. Or the faculty member might say, you know what, you seem to be struggling a little bit. Let me set up a time with you to come back later in the week. We also leave a few seats open, not a lot, maybe one or two, in our courses so that if someone is working and they can no longer attend the morning session, then we have a couple of extra seats that they could come in in the evening. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the actual course model. And so I did this graphic to show you that every course is broken into eight modules. And there's an asynchronous component, which is the online content with the LMS, which we use an open source tool called Sakai. And the students have to take a knowledge and application assessment in each module. We also have the scheduled on-campus lab time, and there's extra time beyond that and then the hands-on assessment as well, but seeing there's 16 assessments in every course, but also notice that we broke it into eight modules so that the students kind of knew how to pace themselves, and then the instructor also assists with that through announcements and communication through the LMS system. What I wanna show you here, I do a lot of the uh, systems design as well as uh, doing some of the development, and this is my model of reverse design and some of you have had courses on this and you've heard about it and this is really a great way of doing technical courses but we actually start at the back end with course competencies and then we go to our hands-on assessment now in that process we also have to modularize but the important thing if you look at the bottom the hands-on skills must transfer 
to the workplace skill requirements. Our employers want to make sure that happens. But the, after that, we do our lab exercises, then our knowledge and application assessments, which is our LMS. You can't develop skills without knowledge. And thus, we do practice quizzes, which is a great tool we'll talk about later. And then the instructional material is probably what takes the most of my time of putting that materials together. We discussed that the industrial technologies curriculum needed to be aligned to meet the employer needs. And so the information was gathered from three sources. We had DACOM validated competencies within the industry, from the industry already. We also have faculty who do corporate training. We have something called custom training solutions here at the college, and they were already going out into our manufacturing setting and delivering training. And then we went and we asked for the job descriptions that were being left unfilled. What is it that there was their need, that they were thinking that they needed to go somewhere else to fill? Give us those job descriptions so that we know we are teaching to fill that need. All the material was then converted into competencies, but we took it back out to our employer partners. We called them subject matter experts. And we asked them if we were still on track. Then that material was divided up into eight modules, with each module having its own set of outcomes. Here's an example of what a hands-on assessment looks like. And as you can see, what we're asking is we're asking the student to go out and build something. We want them to make it operational. We want them to be able to predict how it will work. And then we want them to be able to troubleshoot it by interacting with the instructor. Maybe the instructor is putting in a fault or a break, and then the student is going to have to go out and troubleshoot it. This is what the HOA looks like. As you can see on the left-hand side, there's a spot for the instructor to sign off on the different elements in the HOA. And if a student is struggling with maybe one or two components, they know exactly what it is that they need to go back and work on before they can continue on. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the lab exercises. These are structured hands-on learning experiences. But the important part here is structured. We need to guide our students through that learning process. Uh, this develops the skills, once again, that's transferable to the workplace. And then they also have to prepare the students for the hands-on assessment. So uh, this is an example of one of the labs I had put together for fluid power. Uh, notice the outcomes of the things that the students know that they're going to have to do. I have to make sure the dots are connected between the HOA, the lab exercises, the KAA. We don't want information coming from two directions for the students. This is a simple pneumatic circuit that they're going to actually be uh, doing a lab on with Automation Studio from home. So they will have labs at home through our simulations and they will have labs actually lab exercises in the lab as well. So I want to talk a little bit about our knowledge and application assessment. Uh, these are typically 20 multiple choice true-false questions in the LMS system. Um, every module has one of these. They have to get at least 80% um, in order for them to take the HOA. These questions we try to make applied or situational. That's why we call it knowledge and application based on Bloom's taxonomy. We don't want just remembering and understanding, we want applying and analyzing. And there has to be a correlation between the KAA and the HOA. So an example of one of the KAA questions, the online question is, here's a, a fluid power circuit on the left, a pneumatic circuit, and the electrical controls for it is on the right. And I might use that graphic for two or three questions uh, that the students would have to answer in their KAA. So notice it's more of applied, and we use a lot of graphics in our test questions. Um, we started using practice quizzes, something that we had came up with as sort of a remedy, but it, it became a major learning tool for the students. So if I have a KEA question, I, might make, I, I could make three true-false questions out of it with the same graphic and try to get the point across to the students. And so this is an example of a practice quiz question. And then when they submit their quiz in their feedback boxes, I embed the reason this is the correct answer, and it might enhance the graphic. 
So now it's a learning tool for the student. We even have instructors that are introducing material through the practice quizzes because it's a way of deploying quickly information to a student that they're asked a question. When they submit, they get the reason and the answer. A major acceleration strategy for us. When we found out that the textbooks were not aligning to what the employers needed us to teach, it created a, a need for the faculty to develop PowerPoints, PDFs, simulations, and videos on their own. And all of this material is out on Skills Commons. We used a lot of open educational resources, actually, and manufacturers literature. We used cut sheets from what they would actually be using on the factory floor. And it was an applied learning situation where they learned where to go for information in those cut sheets. And the important thing to remember here is that all of our information is viewable on a portable device. A student does not have to have a certain computer with certain requirements in order to get in here because everything is on our LMS. Any device from a tablet to a cell phone becomes the viewer and allows them access to the material that they need. So I want to talk a little bit about our acceleration strategies. So once again, we move from 16 weeks to eight weeks. You have to do something different if you're going to make that work. One of the things we run into in a lot of our advanced courses is licensed software that the students have to learn how to use. A good example is in our PLC area. We have three levels of PLC courses. The, the vendors license the software to us. The students would typically have to come to campus. One of our strategies, we created a virtual farm, a virtual computer farm. And now every time a student is registered for certain classes, they get their own virtual machine with all of that software loaded that's on our servers. So it's within our licensing agreement, but then from home or the library or Panera Bread or wherever you wanna be with a computer, you can actually come into your virtual machine and do your labs. We also embed interactive virtual simulations that are available 24 seven to the students through their virtual machines. Another thing that's really critical is active learning objects in the online portion of the course. Now this takes a lot of work. Active learning objects is when we try to touch more than one sense. A passive learning object to me would be a textbook and we still use textbooks, but active learning is something we use to accelerate learning. So for an example with that, if I have a robotics instructor and they're teaching FANUC robots and there's 15 students and they're going around and having to show students how to do something individually or by groups of two, it would make more sense to me. And I grab three cameras and set them up, one on the robot, one on the teach pendant screen and one on the keyboard of the teach pendant. And now I created a series of videos that the students play on their portable devices. So that's active learning objects and we created over 300 videos that that are out on that are connected out on skills commons uh, that are uh, that is available if you if you would want to get to those but that is part of our acceleration strategy and then of course the additional lab time that goes beyond the scheduled lab times so now i want to walk into some of our simulators so on your left is a plc simulator and this is an slc 500 now Anybody that's on the line that would be working with PLCs know these are kind of old, but our employers still wanted us to teach these, but we also teach compact logics and control logics and Siemens S7s. But uh, we needed to find a way to get those students to where they could do their labs at home. That doesn't relieve them from their hands-on assessment, but the hard part about teaching PLCs is learning the software. So we made it available through the VM, created this simulator, and notice how they look similar. That unit on the right is what they see from home in their VM. They can click on the buttons just like pressing them in the lab. It operates exactly the same as what it does in our physical labs. So that was a big acceleration strategy for us. Now, if we look at this in a different light, one of the things that a lot of colleges around the country they use like knockoff software emulators to show how PLCs work and how to learn logic. And our employers let us know right away, that's unacceptable. We want them on the exact software they're gonna be using in our plants. And so we had to use the Rockwell and the Siemens software 
but we have it loaded in their VMs so they have access to it. So now the students can actually create their programs in their virtual machine and actually connect them to the virtual simulator, run it, test it, then they can email it to themselves and they get on campus, they can actually pull it down and actually download it into the controller and actually run it for in a real hardware simulator. So once again, acceleration strategy. This is a hardware simulator. The unit on the right is something I build in Automation Studio. Uh, it's a hydraulic circuit with a 4-3 valve and they learn how it works online from home but then they still have to come in and actually connect the hoses to actually connect the circuit and actually go through the HOA with the instructor. I have labs set up on both as well. And then the, the last portion of what I want to show you on simulations, I also use it to tie technologies together. We're really good at the two-year college of silo technology, a PLC course, a hydraulics course, an electrical course, whatever it is, but really PLCs control everything out there. So now I'm building a whole series of simulations with variable frequency drives and with showing how the pneumatics and the hydraulics work together. And so this lets a student see exactly how everything works, the PLC IO, the program in the PLC, and actually see the cylinders moving back and forth. If I run this as a live simulation, you would see that whole thing working right there. Remember we want mastery of skill and flexible pacing, right? But we still have to live within the confines of the college. So if a student completes all eight modules of a course before the end of the eight week term, the student can start on the next course. And about 25% of our students do do this because we do have a large incumbent workforce that we're training here. If they're registered for the next course, they're able to start into the content of that course before the next term. And so they'll see the practice quizzes and even be able to take them. And they're gonna see what the HOA requirements are so they already know what they're gonna be asked to do once they finish, once they start that course. What's the impact on the students? Well, they have a high satisfaction rate. In fact, they actually get frustrated when they're finished with the intensive hybrid competency-based courses and go back to their more traditional courses in say math or English or any other discipline. And I'm leaving some questions, some of their comments on the screen for you. <laughs> what speaks loudest to me is that they couldn't even come to college without this model. If this wasn't in place, this student would not be on our campus. We also had an impact on our employers. They are <clears throat> about 100% satisfied with our new model because they helped to build it. And they are also seeing that when they hire someone from our program, all of them can do it, not half and half anymore. They appreciate the flexibility that allows them to continue to run their shops because we still have small employers in our area as well as great big employers, and yet still get training for their individuals. In terms of faculty, the nice thing here is that they don't have to develop what they're going to teach at the beginning of every term. Our adjuncts are onboarding a lot faster because the curriculum is already in a can and can be just be handed to them. But it gives our faculty flexibility too. They can do more corporate training or other things that are important to them. And there's a consistency in our instruction. So when they get someone in their class, they know that they're coming into their class already prepared. So let's discuss lessons learned for a second because this was a long journey for us. And we learned that in order to change a student's behavior and in order for them to be successful in an eight week model instead of 16 weeks, we had to change the assessment. And it was both the students and the faculty, that culture that needed to be changed, not one or the other, they had to grow together. We also learned, and this is very important, that the faculty don't have to be instructional designers. They can go out and do the videos or create the PDFs and then send it to us at the college, at the administrative level, we can enter that into the LMS for them. We can make sure that it's ADA compliant and do all those other things for them. Let's just get them developing. And most of all, we learned that video is king. Video is king, yes. <laughs> let, let me talk a little bit about that. Okay. I, 
you know, uh, when we uh, when we first went down that road, uh, we we really didn't think much about it. And I started shooting some videos just on how to do things for students, and they become so popular that uh, because think about it, how do people learn today if they you know have to replace their you know the blade on their chainsaw? Well, they're they're going to go out to YouTube, and so we post all of our videos out on YouTube and drop them in. But a lot of custom creative videos, I'll, I'll do four to five track videos to where I drop cut sheets right on the setup of a variable frequency drive. And now the students are actually in the classroom understanding how it works, but also seeing where I found that information in their manuals. So that has really been a big plus for us with that. I'll do this one. Uh, Sarah's losing her voice. So, uh, but uh, final thought on this. Um, this, you know, uh, this is overwhelming to a lot of people. I've worked with a number of colleges around the country, mainly on setting up new grants that they're doing uh, in this area. And, and it is like, there is no way I can take this model and drop it into our college and make it work. In fact, there's been a study on that, that that's the quickest way to failure. But what there is, is the ability to scale elements of it. And, and so for example, we have colleges that are saying, you know, we really like the hands-on assessment model. We'd like to implement that at our college. Could you help us? Yes, uh, that is something that we can show you how that works. And that could be an improvement, uh, let's say intervention in your course. Some are very interested in getting the virtual machines to where they have students, the software accessible to the students 24 seven. So my point is, it doesn't have to be trying to implement a complete model like this, but scaling elements of it in order to improve your coursework. And so that's kind of it for what Sarah and I were going to talk about, but I did want to mention that our contact information is on the last slide of this presentation, as well as the links into Skills Commons, and, and we have submitted just a ton of open education resource material in native file format, so it's all in MP4s and Word and PowerPoint so that you can edit and modify and do what you want. But we really appreciate the participants coming in to our session today. Thanks so much, Sarah and Tom. We do appreciate it. We've got a couple of questions and we're gonna to get to those in just a few minutes. If you have any additional questions, please post them in the chat box and you'll find the chat lever um, either at the bottom or the top of your screen, there's a toolbar for Zoom. And I'm gonna turn it over to Rick Lumadu, who's gonna share with us a few closing statements about um, Skills Commons and then uh, pass the questions along to our presenters. Thank you, Maria, and uh, great job, Tom and Sarah, appreciate that. Um, we got uh, some great opportunities for you to, if you would like to go a little further with us or connect with some of the communities that we have in Skills Commons, stay abreast of what's going on um, in particular industries and areas and sectors that you may be working in. Um, Maria, um, who is our program coordinator for um, our community and outreach on Skills Commons has done just a terrific job and she's organized these impact communities that really are having an impact on um, higher education and employers and workforce training. And so um, this, this link here is um, a place where you can go on Skills Commons and there's a, a hyperlink um, and you'll get that on the PowerPoint presentation where you can go in and you can browse and look around and see all the great um, resources that are available and then opportunities to connect with the community that Alexandra um, is helping to lead on the storytelling. So if that's something of interest to you, there's also a, 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 an impact community on skills to work in developing partnerships and resources um, for different industry sectors and employer engagement and things like that. Um, in that community is the jumpstart to um, instruction, um, instruction and for an orientation course for new instructors coming out of the manufacturing or healthcare or industry, any industry sector um, in general that's coming to teach at a community college or in higher ed, um, and Maria has helped to lead that as well as a number of our um, community members in uh, just 
really honing that course and making it into just an excellent course um, for folks to use. And that's an, an impact community that you may want to check out and um, become involved with, as well as um, just all the other resources that are available on um, the, the community site and the Connect Center of Skills Commons. So um, we'd be really happy to help connect you in any way we, you, that we can, and you could con uh, contact Maria or myself, Rick Lemadu. Um, and uh, again, you can always just use, um, if you lose one of our email addresses or can't remember, support at skillscommons.org um, will come to us and we can, we can follow up with you. All right. Okay, Sarah, could you move to the next slide? And we will, um, Maria is also heading up this part of the um, uh, present, you know, of our social media. So if you'd like to follow us on, um, if you're in Facebook or Twitter or on LinkedIn, um, Maria is oftentimes posting updates and new things that are happening. So, for example, this event, um, or maybe where we might be at a conference, upcoming conference, or um, some things that are happening in the workforce area that uh, our folks would want to be interested in. So this is a, just a great resource to help you to stay current, as it says there. So, um, so feel free to, to follow us there. And uh, go ahead, um, Sarah. And uh, if you want to know more, um, here's the links, as uh, Tom was referring to, that are in Skills Commons, so the materials that uh, they referenced in their presentation. Uh, as well as their contact information. So um, all the resources and contact information here is available. If you still have questions, go ahead and type it in the um, chat window below. Um, but at this point, we're gonna do a little Q&A, and I did see a question there about um, the cap. Uh, Tom and Sarah, is there a cap on the number of students that you guys can have in a course there at Northwest State? Um, and what is that number if, if there is one? So we try to stay with 16. Uh, I, I want to expand on that question a little bit, Rick, because I, I, uh, I am one of the faculty as well as one of the developers, and, and um, we cannot afford to annihilate our faculty. And this is a very intensive uh, model with assessment, and so we cannot do 20 students in a class. It does not work because this is lab. Now, if we did some splitting and creative scheduling, we can handle a little bit more uh, through the LMS, but the instructors don't have to do too much lifting through the LMS. Their main focus is assessment in the lab. We don't go more than 16 in a, tr in a traditionally scheduled course. And the other part that's important, I really focus on trying to build efficiencies into the assessments to where the instructor doesn't have to sit with the student, but get them started. They're working alone, coming back at certain points. There's an optimum point that we strive for to where we, we maximize the time for the students, but don't annihilate our faculty. It's a critical approach. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, great. Thanks, Tom. Another question too is, um, have you seen this model that you guys developed there followed at a four-year level, at a four-year institution? Do you have any uh, information or feedback on that? Or We, we have not. Um, there is, uh, I, I, I am talking to a number of Ohio universities that are really interested. In fact, the provost has me come in. Actually, Sarah and I came to present at multiple colleges at universities with their deans, department chairs, mainly in the technology area. Uh, they would like to build better efficiencies for uh, their classrooms, but we have not seen uh, anything like this at uh, the university, and, and it's actually fairly sparse at the two-year level. We're finding a lot of, of hybrid that is happening, but a few intensive hybrid and our assessment model is kind of unique, but uh, once again, it's, it, we don't see too much of it at all at the at the four-year college level currently. Great. And as far as the faculty buy-in, I know you had mentioned that you don't want to, you know, beat down your faculty and just put all this extra work and labor on them, um, you know, as far as relating to the cap numbers and stuff like that. But um, just in general, you know, often I hear from faculty about the reuse of OER and, um, you know, re reusing something that someone else has done. They feel like, well, then I'm not relevant, you know, as a faculty member if I don't create my own material. 
um, you know, just reading some of the quotes on your um, faculty, you know, the impact on faculty. Have you any pushback on that? And if so, how, how were you able to deal with that? And if not, what were some of the ways that you went about just creating success in that, in that area? Because I know a lot of folks struggle with that in the community college. When we first launched this model, a lot of the faculty did push back and say, hey, you're trying to get rid of us. You know, you want to automate everything and then get rid of us. And it was pretty funny because as they realized working backwards in that, that backwards design, that they got to the fact that their textbook wasn't going to do the job for them and that they had to develop these PowerPoint presentations and videos. It was funny, we were in one meeting and one of them said, this is a lot of work. Don't you realize how much work this is? Yeah, we need you. You're not going anywhere. And they're also really excited to work one-on-one -on -one with those students because that's why they came over to teach in the first place, is to be able to share that skill and to have that time mentoring a student one-on-one -on -one and working with them. They really, really enjoy that. Do you want me to add that? Yeah, uh, I think the, the, uh, the thing that we have not run into that, first of all, Rick, because we are, um, we strive to try to find material and uh, besides you know finding material at different repositories we find a tremendous amount of stuff at the vendor sites uh, companies that make proximity switches that make plcs that make motors that make controls they have all kinds of educational material that's open to anyone to use and we try to drive hard to the cut sheets so the instructors really see their role more as the hands-on lab, a hands-on assessor of knowledge and skills. Uh, they do not push back much from the other aspect because it is a very labor-intensive function that they have. And I think one of the bigger things for us was them developing their LMS skills. That was probably uh, a bigger mountain for us than them not buying into using some OER that was found. Uh, once they got it, they grasp it, they share, they collaborate, but it is critical that the instructors learn their LMS skills on how to communicate with students effectively and do things such as that, um, but really did not see much pushback from OER. Excellent. Thanks. That's great to, to hear that. And um, uh, just your experience there. I, I think that's really critical for, for a lot of folks to hear that, uh, especially faculty, because that, that is one of the first things you hear is, oh, you're trying to get rid of me and put me on autopilot, as you said there, automate me, uh, yeah. Sarah. And there's tons of work. And I feel like, you know, the way you guys are accessing that and using your faculty is really the experts there is the, the flip model, you know, of the classroom where you know, they can have that time to spend with the, the expert, you know, uh, the, the faculty member versus the faculty member spending all the time, you know, developing, creating the content that that's already out there and available. They need that input, as you just said, from the faculty and, and, and you know, being able to answer, ask questions and get answers right from the expert, which is that faculty member. That's, that's the key for them. So, um, really really appreciate that and really it does put more value and greater value i feel on the faculty member yes yep yeah. great any any other questions uh, from the from the group from the audience here i don't see any um tom and sarah do you have any last things you might want to share or say here we've got a few minutes but um if we're if we're done, we're done. We don't need to you know drag it out till the top of the hour. We can finish off here. But um, I wanted to give you guys an opportunity if you had any um, uh, last minute things you might want to say. And, and Maria, you might want to uh, mention as well about the the uh, video at the end. You know the recording as well as the presentation, and where we'll post that at the end that folks can get that these resources after um, the webinar is done. You bet, Rick. It looks like we have one more question from Lance, and he's, he's asking, who are you accredited through? We're accredited through the Higher Learning Commission uh, out of Chicago. And, and one, usually when somebody asks that, they're thinking, they're thinking of CBE. And uh, one of the things that we have done, uh, we, our model that we utilize, we call it a competency-based learning model. It is... Uh, Typically, CBE can be defined a mul multitude of ways. 
uh, from direct assessment to hybrid CBE, and we are actually a hybrid CBE. The Higher Learning Commission does not like direct assessment, and that is where the faculty are not involved. Our faculty are involved, oh, up to their eyeballs. It is, and sometimes they, we worry about them, but we have to make sure that we don't overload them. But our, our accrediting body is that, and our, uh, our chief academic officer is really on board. Especially one of the things that we did when we started this is we adopted the Quality Matters standards. And so every course that I put together has a Quality Matters uh, alignment table to where I align every module outcome to the course competencies and which competencies are covered in every module and what are the educational resources and the assessment method and what technology is used. I cover all the bases on that as well as time on task, the amount of hours outside of the classroom, the amount of hours online, the amount of hours in the lab. Uh, I was a former dean, so I had to follow a lot of the, uh, the academic processes, but I make sure that we are actually doing things that are more advanced probably than anybody else at the college from an academic standard. And so she's very aware of our academic standards, the chief academic officer, and is very much a supporter of what we are doing with, uh, with our model. Thanks for that, Tom. And do you have any financial aid issues, specifically federally? Uh, go ahead. I, I think what the confusion is, when we accelerate a student, we still have those eight-week containers, okay? So if you know what a MOOC is, a massive open online uh, way of learning, what we do is we allow them access to the information in the next course that they've registered for. However, they cannot do any testing on that course until the start date of the next term. And so we are still compliant with uh, financial aid. We don't have any of those issues because we still fit into those nice containers for our registrar, financial aid, advisor, dean mm -hmm. admissions, and everything else. But what happens is we do sometimes get students who accelerated and then accelerated and then before you know it, they're in a class and they're done within three weeks. And we actually encourage that because of our incumbent workers, they don't know when they're going to have a call and have to go to Argentina for three weeks. And so it's just, it gives us all a little bit of flexibility. And it also gives us an opportunity, something I didn't discuss today, for prior learning assessments that can take time for a student to get around, or work experience, because we have a very robust internship, uh, apprenticeship program and so maybe we can get some work-based learning for a student who's accelerating and that's where our career coaches come in so if, if you have further questions about that uh, please drop us some email yeah and one thing on the financial aid you know our courses are all within the financial aid model we we don't allow courses in the blackout period in the the last two and a half weeks of december we we have the blackout period in the first part of January as well. Uh, we follow, our, all of our courses are within the semester timeframes, and thus the credit hours are accumulated accordingly so that the students do qualify for financial aid. One of our biggest advantages though, all of these courses we converted, we ran in a regular traditional schedule for many years. And now we have converted them to uh, realign them, new content. We have to take everything back through academic affairs. But as long as we don't change the contact hour or the credit hour, we really don't have to send things back through our state agency or our accrediting agency. Or, you know, we're not changing any of our containers, financial aid containers, which are certificates and degrees. So we don't really have to cycle anything through the Department of Education as well. So we, we really follow the rule because we cannot afford to lose financial aid. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, so we have time for one more question. And um, Helene is asking, now we know that we owe a dollars are um, specific to the region. And so this won't um, necessarily apply across the board, but are your students receiving WIOA support? Yes, they are. We have TANF funded students, we have TAA funded students, we have WIOA programs. We call it CCMEP here in our region, um, which follows like a TANF fund. But 
It's a short-term certificate that we offer industrial automation maintenance with 10 courses. All of them are in this format. Fantastic. I appreciate that. And um, I'm, John had just one more uh, little comment about the, the question previous to the WIO, and I'm just going to read to you what he has to say because John Milam out of Lord Fairfax is a CBE expert, and he's sharing that that last question was about completing a course and documenting the completion date versus the end of the course date. It impacts veteran affairs for calculation of satisfactory academic pro progress. So um, if, if there are other questions um, relative to that, please email Sarah or Tom directly and um, they can, they've offered themselves up as, um, as kind of uh, uh, consultants based upon this little piece of information. So you get today free information, just send them an email with your question and I'm sure they will get back to you in a, in a pretty short period of time. Yes. So we are going to be posting this particular webinar along with the PowerPoint and it links embedded into the um, Skills Commons site. I will send a link to everyone who has registered um, through Eventbrite and we'll make sure you get uh, a copy of that. We'd love to have you come and spend a little time in Skills Commons if you haven't been there in a while. There are lots and lots of new things going on. We have an apprenticeship showcase and a handful of other things you heard Rick mention. Thank you everybody for being here today. We do appreciate your time and that is it for us. See you next time. Take care.